tonight we're in Galatians chapter 6 and this tonight hopefully we'll finish up the book of Galatians but before we get started we need to um, we need to look at a scripture it's James chapter 3 verse 16 James chapter 3 16 glad you came out tonight it says for where envy and strife is there is confusion in every evil work and so just for a minute before we get into the Bible study I want to talk to you for just a minute about some strife that's in the church it has the ability and the design to dissolve this church and I pray that it doesn't do that um, I need to I feel like apologize to this church and ask for forgiveness because um, there is confusion in this church and as a communicator that's a terrible thing um, several people in this church some have left some are thinking about leaving because they think that I'm teaching that they're going to go to hell now let me just say this and the apology is real I, I apologize I'm, I'm uh, broken over it um, you've probably never heard anybody teach the security of the believer like me matter of fact I don't think if you're born of God's seed you could go to hell if you wanted to I think you could stand there and say God put me in hell he wouldn't put you in hell you couldn't go to hell no matter what so I think there's some confusion there are some people that's concerned that I've gotten away from teaching the Bible that's what I live for and I'm focused more on let's say current events or conspiracies. and I've taken that and I apologize for that the only thing that drove that was uh, a love for you that I didn't want you to be deceived and um, we'll do a little bit of that tonight but not very much and we're going to try to get back to teaching God's word but here's what I believe saying all that I believe the Bible should be our final authority in faith and practice and what does that mean that means in everything you believe and in everything you do and I also believe that you could take today's newspaper and set it right beside your Bible and you would be amazed I also believe that we're in a day that never has been before you are seeing things happen every day that never has happened before now I just want to before we go any further I want to just I'll just this is how I do um, the big elephant in the room is if I take the vaccine is that the mark of the beast I don't think that it is but I think it's so close to it the only reason why I teach about the vaccines I haven't liked vaccines for a long long time probably ever uh, I don't take anything I don't take a Tylenol I don't take nothing and I don't believe anything that the authorities tell me you say well that's stupid that's me that's how I live and what I know I think it's very dangerous for some people and I love you people and let's just be honest if we can't be honest I think you guys are my family and when people in my family are confused about what I believe and are thinking about leaving my family that hurts now let's just be honest most of you in my family is pretty old and let's just take for example a man in his 70s who's 150 pounds overweight and he takes the vaccine and he dies of a stroke they're not going to blame the vaccine yet the vaccine's been proven to cause strokes they're not if he has a heart attack they're not going to blame the vaccine he's 70 something years old and he's overweight and he has all these other yet the vaccine's proven to cause heart trouble if he has immediate congestive heart failure they're not going to blame the vaccine 
because he's 70 something years old. Is it going to shorten his life? Yes. Well, I can't just sit back and not tell you what I know. I don't care if you're 70 something years old. I want you to live your life out till God says it's done. And I don't understand why we will take the word of a computer programmer who had a business who, who caused viruses in his computer so that he could sell you an antivirus. And for 20 years, he's a third generation person that said we need to kill most of the people on the planet. He's wanted dead or alive in many countries for what he did to those countries by giving them free vaccines. But we'll take his word, but biologists who's given their life, even vaccine makers who say don't take it, we say they're crazy. Yesterday, the number two guy and the number three guy at the FDA resigned because the woman that's running the FDA is crazy. She's the one that pushed to get uh, full uh, coverage for fentanyl. It's a hundred times more deadly than hillbilly heroin. She's the one that got it passed to give your children oxycotton. Well, these two men said, we can't go along with it no more. They're saying we need to take the booster and it's not been approved. And they're saying we need to vaccinate our children and that should never happen. Now I want you just to stop and think, these men, how much money do you think they're making? They have mortgages, they have boats, they have houses, they have, and they quit their job. There was a little over 200 scientists in China. And when this thing broke, 90 some odd of them quit their job in China at the threat of murder, imprisonment. They're, I'm just trying to tell you there's something up. And then the Bible has a lot to say about it. I just had a woman in my office before I come out here. She said, do you think I'm going to hell? Listen, I think we need to revisit those verses. I said, no, I don't think you're going to hell. She said, well, I took the vaccine. I said, I don't think you could go to hell if you wanted to. If you're born again, are you born again? Well, of course I am. So I apologize. Um, I probably focused on it more than I should have. But I'm just, I don't know what else to tell you. I love you. I don't want to see you hurt or sick or die. Look at this. Look at this verse. We've got to hurry. I've got a long way to go tonight. Please don't get up and walk out. Stay with me. Psalms 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That means something that's not true. Well, that's because the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Now listen, we, maybe, you know, I mean, I'm apologizing. Maybe we have focused on the bad and not enough on the good. But John 3.16 is 75% negative. One day we was in Josh's class and I was sitting by this little sweet Joanne and she said, where's the good? And Josh was just so passionate, you know, he just, you know. There is hope. It's found in Jesus and salvation. And God just laughs at them. And then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Now, God's not uh, going to be duped on this thing or taken over. God's gave you the words in the book that says there's going to be millions and millions of people eradicated. Why? 
one place, one third of mankind. Yesterday I was driving down the road and I, I don't know, I haven't had time to look into it. But I'm not going to say God gave it to me, but this is what I thought. Because I've had my mind on those verses forever. You know what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 9? It says that there were four angels loose from the river Euphrates that were prepared. I looked that word up before and it means made. Made for a purpose. Isn't that weird? That an angel would be made for a purpose. It says for to kill one third of mankind. They were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year. There's something there. And I just was driving. I was thinking about everything that's happening. And I was thinking about, you know, we know that they began this whole thing not in China. China got the information from us. But we started it making these new viruses called M. Uh, MNRA and that is a messenger virus and they used COVID because it's so contagious but it was just common cold but they mixed four other viruses with it and they spread it in the Middle East and they said that uh, Pentagon said they could make it racial uh, specific in other words if you were a Syrian they could spray you and it just kill Syrians and not uh, Iraqis. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, angels that are made, something that was prepared or made, and then I thought, it's, these viruses were loose there first. And we saw the guy from the Pentagon said, we can take away their um, jihadists. We can take away their um, uh, fanaticism in their God. Wow. Then it hit me. The word angel, the definition of it is messenger. Well, there's four of them. And I won't even tell you what I think about that. So I don't know, but then there's another place. So a third of mankind's going to die from something loose there. I always thought it was a war. And if you don't think you're in a war, you're in a war, baby. It's a bio war. But we may not be being attacked from without. We may be being attacked from within. Don't you think it's strange that our military men, they always take an oath to protect against foreign and domestic. That's our biggest threat, I believe. So I want to show you this, and it doesn't have anything about the cough cough or the shots or anything, but it does have something to say about our lesson today and about the world we're living in now, if you weren't watching T Tucker Carlson when this happened, you will not find it. It's been wiped, but I got it. And I just want to show it to you so that you'll have the information. But it won't hurt my feelings if you don't believe like I believe. Show it if you can, Kenny. Talk show host Glenn Beck that he made against the U.S. State Department. Hey, Doc, right. I have been troubled all weekend by what I heard uh, Glenn Beck say. I didn't hear it last week. My daughter sent it to me right. uh, over the weekend, and I just was shocked, stunned, at what he said happened in Afghanistan by the U.S. State Department. And we're going we're gonna to sh share with you several video clips of Glenn Beck. First of all, I want to commend Glenn Beck uh, for his work to rescue Afghan Christians. He has raised over $30 million in a matter of days. Yes. Uh, one large donation came from Bill O'Reilly. Uh, the, the private jet 
that Mr. Beck is using to get around the Middle East to coordinate this rescue operation was donated by uh, Kenneth Copeland. A lot of people uh, did things that were extraordinary gifts. And so to all the people that donated a total of over $30 million, to Glenn Beck, to Kenneth Copeland, to everybody who has done something to rescue Afghan Christians, I salute you and commend you. And I am very proud of you that you, you've done this. Uh, the first article we want to show you is the Catholic News Agency. And, and this is from earlier last week. And this was the first indication that there was something going on in Afghanistan regarding uh, Christians that were being singled out or separated from other Afghans that were being allowed to leave. Somehow Christians were not being allowed to leave. So Catholic News Agency was one of the first to uh, pick up on this. Um, you know, Doc, this reminded me, this is, this is a, very similar to what Obama did uh, with the Syrian refugees. Uh, I recall so that. Obama yes. would not allow Syrian Christians to enter the country. Right. And as the week has progressed here, last week, uh, and uh, other outlets like LifeSite News was reporting on this as well, um, they, you know, LifeSite was one of the first ones out there, along with uh, Mr. Beck, directly accusing the Biden White House and the State Department as colluding together in blocking the rescue of Christians from Afghanistan. And that there was some... Uh, whether it was a written rule or not, or unspoken rule for sure, that Christians were being singled out and not allowed to leave Afghanistan. And the accusation is such, according to Mr. Beck, because he had people on the ground, that they may have actually been allowed to... This is where this gets absolutely horrifying and shocking and will make you furious when you hear what Glenn Beck said on Tucker Carlson's show. We're going to play this for you. Then Doc and I will discuss the accusation. So in the last week, a small number of Americans have headed to Afghanistan and the region to help evacuate people who are trapped there because the Biden administration just isn't doing that very effectively. Glenn Beck is one of those, one of those Americans trying to help. His charity, the Nazarene Fund, has already helped rescue thousands of Afghan Christians from the country. Glenn Beck joins us now from a location in the region. We'll leave it there. Glenn Beck, thanks so much Thank you for much. coming on. You um, so you just headed over there at the drop of a hat. I have, you were texting me on the way. I'm, I was mm. kind of amazed. Um, tell us what you've seen since you've been there. What have you learned? What's it like? Um, I'm not um, in Afghanistan. I'm in one of the countries in the region that are actually taking these people um, as refugees as a weighing station just to get them off of the tarmac. They, they do not want to be identified because they are concerned about the new um, coming terror that is going to be happening yeah. in the region. Um, I will tell you that uh, we, have, we have pulled out 5,100 uh, people, uh, Christians, women, children, um, and put them on planes. See what you're seeing there is one of the last planes that took off before the bombing uh, or bombings today. Um, we had about 500 refugees, women and children mainly, um, and we had them inside of the airport today. And uh, one military official um, asked them, uh, didn't ask them, ordered them to go back on the other side of the gate. I have pictures of them this morning pleading to get back through the gate. Um, and then I have pictures of blood and body parts and um, nothing but death in that same area. We believe that our State Department uh, is directly responsible for what we believe were some of these people. I don't know how many survived. Oh. Have you been able to get a sizable number of Christians out of Afghanistan? It seems like that's a group that would need to leave. 5,100. Um, the, wow. the, uh, the country that I'm in right now is at their limit. There are only three countries. The State Department has blocked us every step of the way they have the State Department and the White House have been the biggest problem. 
everyone else, everyone else has been working together, putting aside differences and trying to get these people to safety. The State Department and the White House have blocked us every single step of the way. In fact, an ambassador was called in Macedonia last night uh, and, and told uh, not to accept any of these people as we were trying to get them off of the tarmac here to keep the airport flowing and getting these Christians out. We haven't really been able to move anybody for about 12 hours. Our mission is now changing greatly. We have to send people into even greater danger to try to smuggle these Christians out who are marked not just for death, but to be set on fire alive because they're converted Christians. Uh, also tomorrow, I'm getting back onto another plane. So you know, not funded by the Nazarene Fund, nothing I am doing here, I'm paying for this here. Copeland Ministries has, has let me borrow their jet, but we're going someplace else to open up two countries, and I don't even wanna say who they are, because I'm afraid our State Department will call them yeah. and threaten them. Uh, but we are going to move these people to new homes, and they are going to be a blessing to some country. I don't know why we have open borders. I mean, it's really interesting. We have open borders and closed airports. One group of people um, are exploited, raped, and killed by drug cartels. And then the other group of people are raped, exploited, and crucified or set on fire by terrorists. There seems to be a pattern with the Biden administration. Yeah. So Islamic countries, Muslim countries are more eager to accept Christians from Afghanistan than our State Department, which really it, it These, tells you a lot. This country that I'm in, I begged them last night to let me tell them, tell the world who they are. They, they have more compassion for these Christians than our American government. And it is insulting, embarrassing and wrong. Yeah. What our government is doing now, I believe, is out and out evil. Well, I hope you'll come. I hope at some point you'll tell us what country that is. Glenn Beck, Godspeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Is that the most shocking? And I'm here to tell you it's not Biden. The Bible calls it a beast, it's a whole world. It's not a debacle. There are hundreds and hundreds of people that make these decisions. But the last military man left yesterday, and there are thousands of Americans left. We've never done that before, as far as I know, anywhere. And I was told a lot of these military men didn't want to go. They were threatened with court-martial if they didn't leave. It's not Joe Biden. It's not some old senile old man they just make a boogeyman for you to hate it's a plan it's been planned for years and years and the devil has nothing but time and he likes killing believing Jews and Christians and you can't wrap your brain around it because you've been coddled and you've been in the cradle of America. You can't think about somebody being so wicked. They are. They're devilish. I had a man that left this church accuse me. He said, you said every person in Congress drinks baby's blood. I've never said that. I just said a lot of them do. They admit it. I didn't say all of them do. I mean, if you're going to say something, I say, at least get it right. But they've been doing that ever since the beginning of time. I wouldn't doubt one bit if when Cain hit Abel in the head with a rock, he didn't go up and taste his blood. I mean, that just me. So maybe it ain't some old senile old man in the White House. Maybe it's a machine. And maybe the whole thing is just to kill Christians. Well, the Bible, this is a Bible study. The Bible says they're drunk on the blood of the saints. And just because they don't look like us. Let me tell you something. Maybe one of these days I'll teach on it. What is the path of the return of Jesus when he comes back? 
Before he hits Mount Olives, everybody talks about Mount Olives. He's going to split Mount Olives. He's going to go through the Eastern Gate. Before he goes there, he liberates the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Nobody ever talks about that because we can't believe there's Christians in Egypt. Well, because they don't go to Brahms after their services, you know. They, wear, they all wear bed sheets and they can't be Christians, you know. They're not Baptist. Let me ask you something. The Southern Baptist is the largest religious system other than Catholics. How come we're not over there? Millions and millions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, why, why don't we rent a plane? Because we're a bunch of sissies, that's why. Why does it take a Mormon, and Ken, Ken Copeland's got ten planes, and he gave Glenn Beck, why does it take a Mormon to show us up? And then we go around saying, well, they don't even believe in the same God. Well, whatever God they believe in has him compassionate enough to go try to save a bunch of people while we don't. Now, I don't get it. So, I would be really surprised if Glenn Beck doesn't just get to a place where he has to jump off of a building or dies of a heart attack or, you know. Well, now, the president of Tanzania, now, you remember, he was a medical doctor in great shape, and he sent in the blood off of his BMW, and it come back positive, and then he sent the juice out of a papaya. Well, shortly after that, he died of a heart attack. And then the king of Haiti, you know, the king of Haiti started talking about the same, and guess what? Heart attacks must be contagious because he died too. So Glenn Beck, you better have somebody checking your chicken strips. So let's go. Here we go. Galatians chapter 6. Let's go to Romans 2, uh, 8, 2. This book of Galatians is the foundation of Romans, and it's all about this ideal that these Jewish believers, uh, not in Jesus, but Jewish people had come in there and they told these believers who were mostly Jews, okay, it's okay, it's fine if you want to believe in that zealot, Jesus, because the Jews always had somebody they followed. All the way to Acts chapter 19, years and years and years later, Paul finds a group of devout believing Jewish men who were still following John the Baptist who had had his head cut off for Jesus 20 years ago. So the Jews, they always had a favorite rabbi or a teacher. You see it all through the churches. Uh, in the book of Corinthians, Paul says, hey, you bunch of dumb dumbs, you know, you say, well, I'm of Apollos and I'm of Paul. And, I'm, and he said, stop that stuff. Well, that's just the way they were. Well, they come to these Jews who were in this thing called the way now, and they said, that's all fine and good. You want to follow that nut? Go ahead. But you still got to keep the law because it's written in the books of Moses that you got to keep it. They didn't understand about dispensations. And they said, well, now, now wait a minute. Paul says that, that we don't have to keep that. Yeah, you got to be circumcised. Well, they said, well, now, Paul. And you know what it was? It was strife. And it brought confusion. And so Paul says, watch this. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So Paul says we're free from the law, we're dead to the law, we're delivered from the law, and that Jesus is the end of the law. Galatians 2.19. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. If you were in Sunday school, you know that at the fruits of the Spirit, it says, from which there is no law. They asked Jesus, well, what's the greatest commandment? Well, what are they asking? What they're asking is, man, there's a whole bunch of them, but which one do I really need to keep? And he said, I just love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. You don't have to worry about anything else. 
and then love your brother like you love yourself. That's the whole of the law. You don't have to worry about stealing something from somebody if you love them. You don't have to worry about murdering somebody or committing adultery with somebody or Romans 7, 6. Romans 7, 6, he says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So you were dead under the law, now you've been born again under Christ. And in Romans 10, 4, it declares that Jesus is the end of it. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Jesus Christ ended the law. The law was God's uh, mechanism to get people to a point of righteousness, of right standing with God. They had to keep these laws best they could, but they couldn't. So they had to sacrifice the blood of an innocent animal to cover up where they messed up not keeping the law. Okay? But when Jesus came, that ended that. We don't keep the law no more. We don't keep the Sabbath. Jesus is the Sabbath. So we've taught on it at nauseum. So now chapter 6 of Galatians is a particular application. How do we live it? That's one of the things I feel like God's blessed me to do. Everybody talks about different things, but nobody knows how to implement them. Everybody talks about salvation, and I've yet to meet a pastor yet that knows how you're saved. You ask them, well, how's a person born again? Uh, they believe and be baptized, and they get those big old lists of things, but they don't know what happens. So look at this. So in this chapter 6, he finishes up the book, and he has four categories. First is it's our, our sacrificial service for the believers. We have a sacrificial service, one, to sinning Christians. Do you know you have a responsibility to sinning Christians? You have a responsibility to me. If I get off course... And, and several people in a very loving way this week has done that. They said, we think you're off course. And I didn't burn their house down or hate them. I love them. And I said, I take that. I need that. I'm trying to get back on course. But I didn't get off course because I don't like you. I got off course. It'd be like if you broke your arm and I broke the speed limit getting to the emergency room. Yeah, did I, did I break the speed limit? Yeah, but I was trying to get you there quicker. But you have a responsibility to sinning Christians. We ought to be able, if I see David J. straying, we ought to have a relationship as brothers in Christ. I could go to David J. and say, David, I love you. But I think you're straying. And David ought to be able to say, thank you. Not, you're fat, get out of my house. And I'm glad he stopped doing that. It was very hurtful. So, one, you got a sacrificial service for sinning Christians. Two, burdened Christians. Three, pastors, teachers. And four, to all people. So let's go. Galatians 6 1. Watch this. This is sinning Christians. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Not weakness, meekness. And meekness is the kissing cousin to kindness. Considering thyself, fancy pants, lest thou also be tempted. Okay? So before you go trying to line somebody out, um, you know, we have a responsibility to each other. But the spiritual person, I always wanted to have a car club and use that verse because it's about restoring so we, what? We restore them back to their place. 
One thing that churches do, they'll have a person in their family. And some people throw that around, church family, church family. To me, y'all are my family. And they'll have one fall. And then that person will get back up. And they'll let them get back up. And they'll be happy for them, but they don't never put them back where they were. They always keep them in that place where they fell. That's not right. When you restore a vehicle, I guarantee you, Ricky Swipe both ends 57 T Birds better now than it was in 1957. Charlie's 57 Chevy has some great air conditioning. In 57, they didn't. Uh, they have radial tires now. If you've never driven on nylon tires, you don't even know what it's like. So when you restore something, it should be better than before. That's our responsibility to sinning Christians. The word restore here in the Greek means mending broken bones or mending torn fish nets. Look at Romans 7. Let me show you how this works. And I got this in my Bible so I wouldn't mess it up. Romans 7, verse 17. I got to take my glasses off. So verse 17. Got it up there? All right, watch this. Now, now you got to watch this and you got to catch it because Paul is brilliant. Now, then it is no more I. So Paul's talking about that I is himself, not his body, but him himself, which is his soul and his born-again spirit. Now, I want you to watch the contrast he does all through this section of Scripture so that you know the difference. So he says, Now then it is no more I that do it. So technically, when a born-again person sins, their spirit don't sin. It's not technically them. But I know it is their body. For example, my youngest son, you know, he'd be strung out on something or something, and he'd say something awful and ugly to me. And other people would say, well, now, Sherman, don't let that hurt your feelings. That's just the drugs talking. And I'd say, yeah, but it's coming out of his head. So don't get me wrong. And what you do in your body, it may not contaminate your spirit, but it, you will reap what you sow in your body, not in your spirit. Your spirit and soul has been cut away from your body. Your spirit will never reap, once you're born of God's seed, what your body does. But you'll reap it in your body. You say, well, I don't understand that. That's confusing. Okay, let me make it crystal clear. You can take a chainsaw and cut your leg off. It don't cut your spiritual leg off. And then the rest of your life, you'd be like, man, that was a stupid thing to do. And we'd be like, yes, it was, Hoppy. But you don't cut your spiritual leg off. You don't believe me, do you? Scientists proven. Scientists took, uh, they took a leaf. And under this um, machine that they had made, this is years ago, it could tell the aura of something living. And they took a leaf. And while it was attached to the limb, it had this vibrant aura around this leaf. They plucked the leaf off. They stuck it underneath there. It still had this vibrant aura, they called it. They called it an aura. It was life's what it was. And, but it dimmed. It just started dimming as the leaf was plucked from the vine. So then they plucked another leaf, and they cut a triangular notch out of the leaf. And guess what? The aura kept the shape of the leaf. So they tried it with a human being who had lost their hand. And wouldn't you know it, the aura of a living human being still traces with the fingers and hands. They tried it with a person that lost their leg. Would you believe, would you be crazy enough to believe, I didn't do it, I ain't making it up, you know, like the lady here that says, I think you just make stuff up. It, the aura tracked with the leg. 
that was gone. If you've ever been around somebody that's an amputee, they'll say strange things like, I know my hand's gone, but my fingers itch. Well, yeah, your finger's gone, but your spirit and soul's there. Listen, they're not taking a picture of your flesh. That's an x-ray. They were taking a picture of you. Watch it. I'm never going to get finished. Now then, it is no more I that do it, talking about sinning, but sin that dwelleth in me, in his body. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh. He's separating the two. For I know that in me, parentheses, that is my flesh, I'm talking about now, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not in my flesh, parentheses. For the good that I would do, not, but the evil which I would not, that I do, parentheses, in my flesh. Okay? Watch this. Now, if I, talking about his spirit, now he switched, do that I would not, it is not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in my flesh. Watch it. I find then a law that when I would be, and when I would do good, evil is present with me in your body. Now, y'all just keep looking straight ahead, but every one of you in here have sin in your body. But if you're born again, it's not in your spirit. Watch it. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's your spirit. Your spirit delights in God. It's born of God's seed. It's an incorruptible seed. Your spirit couldn't sin if it wanted to. But your flesh was born of a corrupt, corruptible seed. Blame that on your daddy. Watch it. But I see another law in my members. So my spirit, my inward man, it runs on one law, the law of Christ, the law of love. But he said, I see another law working in my body. Watch this. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Not his brain, his mind. That's a spiritual reference. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members or body. So my body, as long as my spirit's in my body, brings my spirit into captivity to the stupid stuff that I do that Paul said, I don't even want to do it, but I wind up doing it. And it's like a schizophrenic who spiritually looks down and is like, what are you doing? Watch it. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so that with the mind, spirit, I myself serve the law of God and with the flesh, the law of sin. That's it in a nutshell. So, here we go. Galatians 6, 2. Watch this. We got to get there. We got somewhere to go. We got to get there. Bear you one another burdens. Now this is the second category. We have a um, uh, service. We have, what did I call it? I don't even know what I wrote down. We have a sacrificial service to sinning Christians and then burdened Christians. So watch this. Do you, you know what that means? That means when you're living your life together with these people in your family, or in your church family, and you see one of them burdened, you have a sacrificial service, a responsibility to try to help them, not just say, oh, they look burdened. Watch what he says. Bear ye one another burdens. Now, in the Greek, that word there used for burden, it, uh, the reason why I'm telling you this, because in verse 5, it's a different word. That word means a lofty weight that no one could carry by themselves. And what happens in churches is they see someone that's burdened and they think it's contagious. And they go off and say, well, I'll pray for them. 
Well, don't waste your breath. You have a responsibility to try to help them. I always tell people that. Now, I mean, I'm praying for you, and that's very important. Don't think I'm belittling that at all, but what can I do for you? Because I've been in that place, and everybody I knew said, I'm praying for you. And that was great. But I was under a load I couldn't carry by myself. And there were several of you in this church saw that. And you didn't even realize what you were doing, but you came to my rescue. That's what he's saying. Hey, you see somebody, they're under something. They can't make it. They can't carry it. It's a burden too big for any one human to carry. And, and there's several of you here that you saved my life. And so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? That you would bear each other's burdens. That's part of it. Watch verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So to bear someone else's burdens, you will have to lay aside something. You have to lay aside something of your own, and that thing is conceit. Conceit is an attitude that breeds uh, intentional failures in others or an intolerance of failures in others. Conceit. The ideal that you are above failing and the ideal that you're above deceit we're not so what is the remedy for self-deceit it's the next verse look at verse 4 and 5 but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another for every man shall bear his own burden now, that's the same word in English, burden there and burden before, but this time in the Greek it means just a backpack of a soldier that he's responsible for and fully capable of carrying it by himself. So what are these verses saying? Paul says we have a sacrificial responsibility to our Christian brothers that we see under a burden that they cannot carry by themselves. But we also have a responsibility to carry our own backpack and not be sloughing off our backpack on our other brothers. In other words, man up, grow up, become a soldier, endure hardness like a good soldier. Carry your own weight. So that's the second category. Now we're going to move to Matthew 11. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30. Watch this. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So Jesus tells us that if we would learn of him, our burdens would be light. The burden that he will put on us is light. The burden that the world may put on you or circumstance or your sin or the devil or whatever you want to call it may be more than you can bear. But don't ever, the Bible says, let a man say that God is tempting them. In other words, don't ever think that God has given you more than you can bear. Now that's not to say there's a lot of people going around saying that, you know, that God won't allow that to happen to you. You can put yourself in a situation or someone else may put you in a situation that's too much for you. But don't say God did. So, now the third group that we're looking at. We're looking at four groups tonight. Not the sinning Christian or the burdened Christian. Now we're looking at our sacrificial service to pastors and teachers. So Galatians 6.6, 6, look at what this verse says. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. 
Now, Paul began to teach this, and it was something new. The Jewish people did not support their, their uh, priest. It was almost like a tax. They had taken the ideal of Abraham tithing to Melchizedek, and they had made a law into it. And Moses wrote out the laws, and the laws were... But they morphed into like a tax. So you didn't uh, take up an offering at a local synagogue uh, to take care of individual people. You had to pay your duty to the temple or you paid to the synagogue too, but it was a different thing. So when Paul started these churches, this was a new ideal that people would give tithes and offerings for who taught them and who preached and taught them God's word. This was a new thing that had never been done before. So he said, you know, whoever's teaching you God's word, you owe them all good things. So Paul's saying, you need to support whoever God has for, that's teaching you the word of God. Not just financially, everybody jumps to that, but you're to support them in every way. So look at verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, that's a law of God. And just because you're born of God doesn't mean that you won't still reap in your body what you sow. So you can pick your harvest. And you pick your harvest by the seed you plant. So you're going to reap what you sow. So if you sow good seed in your family and in your life, you're going to reap good things. If you sow bad things, you're going to reap bad things. That's one good thing about God. He's very, very, very predictable. Uh, if you study the Koran, you know, Allah, he just flies off at the handle. And, you know, all, but God's not that way. He's very predictable. Look at Job 4.8. Job 4.8, we're going to have to speed up a little bit. Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness, well, they reap the same. Do you know a few years ago, it was before I came here. I was at uh, Barnesdall. I was serving time at Barnesdall First Baptist. There was a New York play subsidized by the taxpayers of America called Corpus Christi. And it was a play, uh, just blasphemous play about Jesus. And in that play, it, it portrayed Jesus as a homosexual. And in one scene, him and Judas were, uh, let's just say, intimate. And for several years, I tracked those guys, the people that produced that and wrote that, the ones that starred in it. And let me just tell you, they reaped what they sowed. You're going to plow iniquity and sow wickedness, you're going to reap it. Look at Hosea 8, 7. Hosea 8, 7. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. So, I mean, that's a law of God. So back to Galatians 6, 8, and 10. 6, 8 through 10, look at this. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to born-again people at a church in a town. And it wasn't a town. It was an area of Galatia. And a large part of them were Jewish believers, but there was some fake, or Gentile believers. But what he's saying to them, just because you're born again don't mean you can just live however you want to and sow seeds and it won't affect your body. Just because you're born again doesn't mean that you can abuse your body and it won't affect your body. Just because you're born again doesn't mean that you can um, do things in your family that's detrimental and, and your family won't fall apart. You're going to reap what you sow. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life, reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Here you go. And this is where it ties in to the Glenn Beck story. He says do good to all men. That's your fourth category. But especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now you say, well, that seems like that's a little bit uh, bigoted. You treat Christian people better than you do lost people? Yeah, you should. Do you think Glenn Beck ought to go over there and segregate and get the Christians out of there and leave the non-Christians? Yes, I think he should. I, if you ain't figured this out, you ain't read your Bible. God is the biggest segregationist ever. Matter of fact, there's going to come a day he's going to segregate sheep from goat. Matter of fact, he's going to segregate just a select few to live with him and the rest burn in hell. Talk about segregation. Now, I'm not saying that he segregates people by the color of their skin. Don't go out of here saying that stuff. That's crazy. I don't have a racial bone in my body. But to say that God's not, that he doesn't segregate from people, you haven't read your Bible. Do you know what Jesus Christ said? He said, I pray not for the world, but for those that you gave me. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him don't have to perish. But if you think God's just ooh, pining away for the world, the Bible says, you know what God thinks of the nations? Less than zero. Well, he's going to burn it all up. But there's a group of people today that he calls his bride. And if you don't think they're not something special in his uh, future, you haven't read your Bible. Now, every man in here that has a bride, listen up to me. You say, don't tell us about it. You're not doing very good in that category. Just be quiet and listen. Your bride should be the most special person on this planet to you. Not your kids, not your grandkids, and not your dog, and certainly not your cat. But your bride. And I'm not trying to say anything, but if they're not, then you've lost your first love. But that don't mean you can't find it. Go looking for it. You'll find it. I've had several couples in my office. I said, well, they just hate each other, you know. I said, wait a minute. You must have loved each other at one time, didn't you? Well, yeah. I said, well, what did you love about him? Oh, I thought he was key. What did you love about her? I thought she was beautiful. Well, you just called her a witch. And you try to get back and remember those things before, you know, things came in and choked out the love. So Paul says, go back to verse 10. He says, do good to all people. You know, Christian people, it's Christian people. You know, I got in a Facebook fight one time. This guy said, uh, the terrorists and Christians are all the same things. Christians have killed more people than any terrorist ever. And I said, you're sadly mistaken. You think Catholics are Christians. See, that's one reason why Zionist Jews like to kill Christians. Because the Zionist Jews that were gassed in Auschwitz and other chambers and skinned alive were all atrocities done by Roman Catholics and they attribute that to being Christians and I said you got it all wrong son Christians is the only religion that they give up their lives and they give up their careers and they risk their life and go into foreign lands and some of them lay their life down 
for people they don't even know. That's not a terrorist act. Terrorists lay their life down to kill people. It's the exact opposite. So do good to all men and especially unto them who are the household of faith. So we ought to be looking to do good. Watch what Paul says here. So verse 11, he says, hey, hey, he says, look here, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand? Well, this is only six chapters long, so it ain't a long letter, it's just big letters because he's blind. He just can't see very good, and that's what I believe. And I want to show you my evidence, one of my favorite stories in Acts 23, first five verses. Here we go, watch this. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now he's standing before the high priest and all the other guys around, right? And he says, you don't have any reason to have me in here. I've lived uh, in good faith in front of everybody. And the high priest Ananias, who was a devil worshiper. People don't like it when I say that. They don't think anybody's worshiping the devil now. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So the people standing around Paul smack him in the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. That was a bad thing to say. What that meant was they had tombs um, where they buried people and they were full of dead men, rotten bodies, but they would wash them and whitewash them on the outside and make them real pretty. You can drive by them on Highway 60 past uh, Sonic. All my references have something to do with some place to eat. Down there past Sonic on the left going to No Water, there's a bunch of them tombs. And that's what he said. You're a whited wall. You're a whited sepulcher. That was a bad thing to say. In other words, you, you got that robe on, you're all pretty and everything, but inside you're dead. Now, Rocky ain't here tonight, so the little fella goes under the bus. He's told us all, he says, don't put me in the ground because I don't want to be in the water. So he wants Diana to put him above ground in one of them mausoleums or something. And I always tell him, I say, Rocky, Chup's auction's going to come out here and they're going to have three rings going and you're going to be swimming with the fishes. Then Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law? It was wrong for them to smite him. And commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? You're going to judge me against the law and then smite me on the mouth against the law? You're going to say I'm breaking the law and punish me by breaking the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Well, guess what? That was against the law. Then said Paul, I didn't know it was the high priest. Well, he's standing right there. He couldn't see. He said, I didn't know it was the high priest, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, He knew the law, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. He can't see. Oh, he sees good enough to walk around, but he don't see very good. One time he picked up a snake, thought it was a stick. He don't see very good. So back to Galatians, we'll finish this up. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. He said, they show, they're, they're big in the flesh. They, they make a big flashy show that they know something and they're just trying to get you to go back under the law and to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ because they don't want to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. Why would they want you to be circumcised to keep from being persecuted? Because the ones that was persecuting were the Zionist Jews. They were killing them by the thousands and the thousands. It was the Jews. Who persecuted the Jews that believed on Jesus Christ? The Jews. They killed them by the thousands and thousands. We don't even know how many. Go back to that verse, 12. He says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. They thought they was teaching you can follow after Christ, but to keep from being persecuted and affiliated with him, go ahead and be circumcised. Just play along, get along to get along. 
Well, that's James Lankford's uh, political mantra. Well, I had to vote for the abortions because you got to come on. Verse 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, they don't keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that you may glory, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thought the cross was a curse. Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. How can Paul glory in something that's a curse? Because Jesus took the curse. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God there is talking about the believers in Israel. The believers in Israel. That's the believing Jew. The Bible makes a difference between the believing Jews and the non-believing Jews. The ones that believed on Jesus and the ones that did not believe on Jesus. The ones that did not believe on Jesus hated Jesus. They still hate him. They killed the Christians and the believing Jews. Look at this verse in Romans 9, 6, and I'm done. Romans 9, 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. You're not the Israel of God unless you believe on Jesus Christ. You can be a Jew. You can live in Israel, the nation. They've been usurped. They're not even the line of Abraham, and they know it. What's the difference in a Hasidic Jew and a Zionist Jew? A Zionist Jew is a person who believes that uh, the Jew should rule the world at any cost. Well, they get their verses. There's verses in the Bible that say that they're going to, but not until the millennial reign. They're not going to rule it now, but they're trying to rule the world. It's called for the greater Israel. So... Kenny, if you will, put his picture up here. Now, you may not know who this gentleman is, if you will. Yeah, Kenny, go up there. Let's see his mug. This man's name is Anthony Blinken. He's the head secretary of state. Now, Glenn Beck told you over and over and over, the ones that are keeping us from getting these Christians out is our own State Department. Our own State Department called other nations, Muslim nations around Afghanistan and said, we will pull our funding if you allow Glenn Beck to fly these Christians in there. These other nations told Glenn Beck, we would love to have them here, bring them in here. And the State Department, when Glenn Beck disclosed where they were going, called them and like a mafia, threatened them. And Glenn Beck can't figure it out. I wish he'd call me. I'd, figure, I'd tell him. He said, I don't understand it. The interview goes on. If you want to see it all, I'll send you the link. All you got to do is ask me. He says, these Christians were waiting to get on our planes. And the head of state, the State Department of the United States of America, in this giant, giant um, airport, they told this whole group of Christian people to move from where they were and go to this certain little place. They stood over there and begged to get back in line and get begged to get back in line, and it just happened to be the exact place where the bombers blew them all up and killed them. Now, what's the odds of a person in control from the State Department of the United States to tell a group of people you can't stand here, we want you to go stand right over here. There's a hundred acres 
fenced in airport. Now you can't stand over there, you gotta stand right here. Well, this is the head of it. And if you scroll down, Kenny, and you look to his personal stuff, it'll tell you he's a Jew. He's a Zionist Jew with dual citizenship. Do you know how many people we have running our government with dual citizenship? Do you not think that's a problem? Do you know they don't allow anyone else with any dual citizenship except people who are citizens of Israel and America? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. God, we recognize we don't know anything. But what we do know scares us to death. So our faith is in you and our hope is in you. God, we pray for those people in Afghanistan. We pray for our military, that you'll keep them. God, we pray for their, their minds and their emotions that they had to leave and they feel like they're a part of something that was wrong, but they were forced. God, we pray that you, the Holy Spirit would wrap them in your arms and Protect them, God. Protect them from their own thoughts and their own ways. And we pray for those people in Afghanistan. We pray for everyone helping in that area, Glenn Beck and everyone else. That though the enemy raises up a, his head, that God, you would raise up a standard against him. We're thankful that Afghanistan is the second largest growing church, Christian church in the world. From missionaries from Iran, we are thank you that you're on the move over there and you're saving souls. Help us to remember to pray for them and help us to see the truth. God, I pray for Matoka Baptist Church and the people that in this trying time that we'll look to you and we'll search your word out and we'll preach the message of salvation like maybe never before and we'll prepare ourselves for a harvest. I thank you and I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks.